Well, 1983 was the 50th anniversary of the publication of Korsitsky's work, Science and Sanity. 1988 was the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Institute of General Semantics. In 1938, I was a student at the University of Chicago, and as we all know, the Institute was located in Chicago at that time. In fact, it opened up in the summer of 1938. I was 21 years old and had just taken a degree in business administration. And I had been interested in a lot of things. I took a minor in music. I tried a course in poetry. I had to drop it. I had too busy a schedule and was doing a lot of things. Yeah, but one of, the, one of the items of interest around the university of that, at that time was a man named Alfred Korsinski. And he was in Chicago and he had made somewhat of a name for himself. How about that? And uh, let me see now. I got acquainted with Korsinski when he gave a talk. I think sponsored by one of the student organizations, or probably the Chapel Union or something like that. And uh, I heard a lot of things that I thought were very interesting and entirely different from learning how to keep accounts or study insurance and all that sort of thing that I was trying to become interested in at the business school. And that, the, of course, he was getting publicity at the time in the Daily Maroon, the student newspaper. So he was a rather well-known figure. There were a lot of things going on at the university in those days. Uh, you could go to hear Mortimer Adler, Mortimer Adler uh, with a logical proof of the existence of God. I went to hear him talk about that. He had to admit he finally couldn't prove it. And uh, Robert Maynard Hudson was president of the university and we could hear him and uh, absorb some of his ideas. So there was a lot of intellectual ferment going on there at that time. Well, when I heard something about general semantics, I thought, now this is entirely different from anything that I had heard. And I went up and talked to uh, Korsitsky after his talk, and he had a couple of people with him. And I learned that he was going to open the institute and give a seminar. So I gave them my name and address. Now, you understand that um, the first seminar given at the Institute in Chicago in the summer of 1938 was not the first seminar that Korsinski ever gave. He had given a seminar at the university previously at International House, and he had been traveling around the country giving seminars here and there. And I think he had been angling for a position at some university I think he would have liked to have a chair of general semantics at the University of Chicago, but it didn't work out. And of course, looking back over these 50 years, I realized that uh, many of the details had escaped me. I can only recall uh, what comes back to me, but I'm going to see what I can do. However, in that summer, uh, they opened the institute. It was on 56th Street. We used to call it the magic number. The house number was 123456, 1234 East 56th Street. And it was a, an apartment in the apartment building there. Cornelius Crane had given Korsitsky $25,000 to start uh, the institute. And at that time, $25,000 was an awful lot of money. So he got started and sent out the notices about the seminar. I was working that summer, uh, that summer at Marshall Fields. I was working up in the field, moving baked goods from one dining room to another, making a little money to help me go back to school in the fall, get started on a graduate program. And at Fields, I was earning 27 and a half cents an hour at that time. And when the uh, Institute announced its seminar, the tuition was given as $25. Well, I thought $25 for a seminar with Korsitsky can't be all bad. So I thought I'm going to go for it. <laughs> uh, so I would work uh, during the day and then go out to the south side. 
uh, in the evening. I think uh, we met once a week. I'm not sure about that. Maybe it was twice. And uh, there was Karsinski. We had the living room converted into a classroom with rows of folding chairs. We might have had 15 people in the seminar. Uh, Korsinski was a very interesting guy. He was bald, and what hair he did have was shaved off. I mean, there was absolutely no hair on his head whatsoever. He wore glasses. He was heavy set, somewhat overweight. Uh, walked with a, a limp. He used a cane. He sort of hobbled along rather than striding along. And he wore nothing but khaki clothes. He looked like he got them in an army surplus jar. And part of that was uh, that he had an idea that modern dress was frivolous and expensive and didn't mean anything for society anyway. And he was out to show his contempt for those things. Uh, maybe it had something to do with the fact that they were all living on a short stipend at the institute. I wouldn't be surprised. So we used to... Uh, well, more about Kosicki himself. He was a man with a big smile and a big twinkle in his eye. Always spoke softly, but you had the impression that there was a tremendous amount of latent power in the man, that if he ever let loose, he could uh, really lash out if he wanted to. I never saw him do it. Well, we got underway with the seminar. You know, there was a young woman there named Pearl Jonacek, it was said that she was in uh, school going to be a psychiatrist. She used to sit down and make notes of all the examples that, of course, it used to be used in his talk. And the idea of her making those notes was that so that in the next seminar he would use different examples. Uh, whatever happened to Pearl, I'm not sure. After a couple of seminars, I didn't see her there anymore. Somebody else took over the job. And by the way, um, at that time, I was very vague about what general semantics could mean to me. And looking back at my feelings 50 years ago, I can see now that I was searching for something that I wasn't finding in the business school or in the other um, parts of my education. And in many ways, uh, I think I did the right thing by getting into general semantics. So after the first seminar that I attended, I entered the next one, and the next one, and so on. I think the last seminar I took there was in 1944. That was my fifth seminar with Korsitsky, and Korsitsky always thought it was a good idea to repeat the basic items over and over and over. He said, don't ever take the attitude that you understand these points. Study them again, hear them again, think about them again. And his emphasis in the seminars, uh, he didn't get into uh, the ramifications of uh, some of the theoretical points of general semantics. He didn't have much to say about what he had uh, learned from Aristotle or points at which he and Aristotle disagreed or agreed or the way I put it, he never mentioned whether he'd been influenced by people such as Hegel or he wasn't. He hit the basic points as if we were rather uh, elementary students. We didn't know much of anything. And in, again, his emphasis was on applying general semantics in your daily life. You could almost think that you were in a seminar there for psychological therapy, definitely. And one of the examples, I think he opened up the second seminar, the very first thing he said was this particular example. I never forgot it. He said there was a room very quiet, nobody in there. The windows were closed. There's a cabinet sitting with a beautiful glass of vase on it. It was empty. All of a sudden, the vase cracked and broke and fell to the ground. And he said, what happened? Well, he said, some change in the atmosphere, the temperature, a combination of both, and the glass cracked. And he said, why am I mentioning this? I want to bring it out to point out that factors of which we are unknown, of which we are unaware, can often ruin our lives and destroy us. And this is why we're here to study general semantics. We want to point out things that are operating in your lives and of which we may not be aware. 
So I thought that was an excellent way to start the seminar. And somehow, uh, of his many examples, that's the one I remember the most. Now, Korsitsky also uh, was rather rough in his talk. He did not have a command of the English language. He spoke with an accent. He spoke uh, haltingly, and you might even say with difficulty. Uh, and there was one word that I also had stuck with me. He couldn't say the word development. It was always a development with, with Korsitsky. And he used that word over and over, and that was perfectly okay with everybody, of course. Now, uh, he would... And I also heard him refer to a pregnant woman as having a front bumper. <laughs> and he explained that he did those things deliberately talk that way on purpose he said I don't want to come here and give you a smooth flowing talk that you will accept and think nothing of and walk out of here and just let it out of mind he says I want to hit you over the head with what I want to say so this is this is the way he did and this is the way he talked now in addition at that time Korsitsky used to have personal consultations with each of his students. And uh, being 21 and later 22 and 3 and so on, I used to hang around the institute and after the uh, seminar or after the session. He and I would sit down and talk and sometimes we'd have a little glass of vodka there. And uh, we got uh, rather well acquainted. He was always telling me that I had to work at this. And I think at that stage in my life, I didn't know where I was going or what all this would mean to me, but it was all very interesting, and I was happy to think about it and study it. Read it. I had a copy of Science and Sanity at that time. Uh, it was a gift from somebody who had spent the enormous amount of six dollars for an 800-page hardcover book. That was, again, a lot of money. But I didn't read uh, Science and Sanity until after I had been to a few seminars but I did stick with it. I've read it quite a few times by now. Still looking to it occasionally. Well, what else can I tell you? Uh, we used to have New Year's Eve parties at the Institute of Chicago. Drinks were served, or there, there was dancing to records. Everything was uh, very social. And oh yes, after maybe one seminar, I got my sister interested to come to the seminar. And... Um, she met Korsitsky and had her personal consultation with him, like everybody did. And then I talked to him the next week, and he said, this one stopped me cold in the tracks at the time. He said he was very happy to meet her, and he could see that she had a great deal more sense than I did. <laughs> but that was Korsitsky, and that was his way. And that was his way of getting in there and telling you have to do things with general scenario. But I can cannot repeat often enough that his point in the seminar went beyond understanding and accepting the principles of general semantics. His point was uh, apply it in your life. Find out how it can make a difference in your evaluation. And this was the point of the whole thing. And there were a lot of people there that uh, came with uh, apparently personal problems. We never heard about them in the sessions themselves, but they evidently came out in the uh, sessions with Carsey. Downtown, we held it in the field building, 135 South of South Street. Uh, by that time, I was working at the Lakeshore Bank, and I used to stay down one night a week. My sister would stay down with me from her job. We would go up to the field building, attend the seminar, and then we liked that particularly because when it got out, we could run over to the brass rail on Randolph Street and pick up the second set of the Dixieland band that was playing there. And we thought that was a great combination for an evening. The one thing that I got involved with in the early seminars at the Institute, Korsinski himself gave lectures on sem semantic relaxation. Now, of course, Charlotte Reed did it. This was before Charlotte Reed, Charlotte Shushart Reed, appeared on the scene. And he had to have somebody sitting up there, and he 
move your muscles and show how it all works. So I was the model year after year in doing all those things. And uh, when we did this in the field building, we didn't have all the regular facilities, so we had to look around for something for me to sit on. So we found some rickety old thing, and I'm sitting up there in front of the group, and Korsitsky is going to work on me. And this little table got sort of rickety, so I'm looking around and thinking, am I going to fall off this? And Korsitsky stopped and he looked at me. He says, if you feel insecure sitting there, just grab onto my hair. <laughs> Which there was none. But it was, those days were very companionable times with Korsitsky and everybody at the Institute. And of course, I haven't mentioned uh, Miss Kendig's name because she came in there, I think, after the first time. And I again say that there are many important, important things that I have not recalled. And as usual, as soon as this tape is finished, they'll all start flooding back into my memory. But by that time, it'll be too late. <laughs> so all I can say is I was happy to make the request.